Guys, the watch on my wrist, which is seemingly very low key and very dinky looking for the lack of a better word, is $125,000. And this is the topic of conversation today, which is quiet luxury watches, AKA stealth wealth. Stealth wealth. I see how you, I see you did, I, I see what you did there. Quiet. Guys, uh, quiet luxury watches, right? Now this, this uh, was motivated by a show called Succession on HBO. And unless you've been living under a rock for the last uh, couple of years now and didn't see that show, Cut off this episode and go watch that show. Which I'm very upset with the ending. I will just say that for those well, don't, that did not see it. Don't, don't I'm not going to spoil beads. That, that's a very open-ended uh, now, now, the characters on that show, they regularly wear $600 cashmere baseball caps, uh, neutral colors, uh, things without logos, uh, subtle but expensive Tom Ford uh, sunglasses, et cetera, et cetera. And Stealth Wealth style is intended to convey what? Expensive and tasteful. Uh, and of course, the characters on that show didn't quite behave that way. But AKA low key flex. AKA low key flex. Now, uh, why would somebody want to hide their wealth, right? I mean, number one reason in today's day and age is probably crime, or at least that's what most will say if you ask them that question. Where, in my personal opinion, I think it has to do with the type of personality of a person. A lot of people feel that being a little bit under the radar and kind of conveying the message of, those who know, know. You know, it's, it's more t a tasteful way of doing things and having a branding of, you know, Gucci or Fendi all over yourself. And there's nothing wrong with that for those that do, but there's a certain allure to having less is more. Would you agree, would you agree that uh, uh, most uh, people of wealth, of significant wealth, tend to be the low-key? Significant key? wealth. Significant yes, wealth absolutely. tend to be low-key. And it's usually absolutely. when you get into things like new money, yeah. right? newly made money. I was a victim of that myself. I came up from nothing, and when I made some money, I had every Gucci belt under the sun, right? It's new wealth that tends to show things off. And again, there's nothing wrong with that. I like to flex once in a while, right? But some people that have wealth, even if it's newly found wealth, they still don't change their ways, and they tend to stay a little bit more conservative. So I yep. think it's more on the personality. Now, what we wanted to do is we wanted to bring forth some watches which sort of displayed uh, that low-key wealth, meaning for those that know, know. And I'll start with, the watch on Adrian's wrist, I mean. So we have a 5402 SC. I thought you were going to describe what's no, on No, I want you to talk about your I might as well take it off and show everybody. Yes, yeah, so this is a original 1972 made by Gerald Genta, Audemars Piquet 5402 ST. And obviously Royal Oak is, doesn't really coincide with low-key flex. However, something like this is indicative of vintage and if you know, you know type of thing because not everybody who's a Royal Oak fanboy really understands the concept or how important a 5402 is. So what I'm gonna, the reason I wanted to start with your watch and, and the biggest reason I wanted to start with your watch is the fact that it's still somewhat of a flex because everybody knows yeah. what a Royal Oak is. It's getting is. More, but more mainstream it's, for it's sure. Staying, it's staying, it's having somewhat of a flex but nobody knows just how big a flex it is when you're dealing with an original 5402, depending on condition, mm -hmm. exact serial number, uh, box papers, etc. It can be upwards of $150,000, uh, where a Royal Oak, a regulator, let's say 15500 today is what? You're looking at something like this that can be two, two and a half X of its modern counterpart. Exactly, part, so right? that's, a, that's a flex. Yet with the same That's look. a low-key flex within a flex. Yeah. Whereas if I go to the watch that I'm wearing, uh, you have to look really, really closely first and foremost to see that this is a Patek Philippe. Uh, majority vintage Patek Philippe's in this genre in a precious metal will run you under $10,000. Mm -hmm. And from afar will look like nothing special. What this is, is one of very, very few stainless steel watches made in the era back in the 40s. This is the first anti-magnetic watch that Patek Philippe came out with at a time where anti-magnetism, that a word? Anti-magnetism anti was yes. uh, something that was very useful because watches were big time tools. Fortunately, it wasn't Paddock that you know came out with the first anti-magnetic watch. Believe it or not, that was to sell. But nevertheless, it, nevertheless, it's a very, very, very important watch, and it's just a very low-key flex because from afar it can look like a five-dollar watch, it can look like a Timex or anything else. So this is a true, true low-key undercover flex. So I'm going to go into now that we're talking about Patek Philippe, I'm going to go into the 5074R. That's a minute repeater perpetual calendar, and this is one of the things that Patek Philippe. Let me just show it into the camera right here. Absolutely beautiful, more modern case size as well. It's on a bigger case size for for a high complication Patek Philippe, especially at the time that it was made. This is what Patek. Philippe does actually better than anybody else, right? I've always wondered, how come they never show the tourbillon cage? And not that this is a tourbillon cage, but for them it works. And it's pretty much the essential and the definition of what a low-key flex is. Those who know, know that a grand complication minute repeater tourbillon Patek Philippe, the tourbillon is hidden. You cannot see it, right? And they have, they have used that business model 
from its inception all the way till now, and they will never change that. Well, I think that it's safe to say that Protect Philippe is the conservative brand, major brand on the market. There are plenty of conservative brands out there, but if you want to talk about the majors, Protect Philippe is the major conservative brand. Ma major, I would say like big player brand. Big you know top I mean? five brands, yeah, yeah. Protect Philippe will be most conservative. You don't see them jumping on the bag and wagon of material use, ceramic, carbons, Carbons, and th yeah. uh, things of that nature. They do use diamonds and gem set, but I think that's a that's But that's in the line set. of gem set watches that every other company Correct. does have. But since you talked about the 5074, I think the biggest flex in the 5074 is that from afar, it'll look like a Patek Philippe chronograph. So again, this is a- Looks like a 5970 This is a low-key low key flex yeah. uh, within a flex, because it's still a big gold pad. 10 feet away looks like a 5970 but What, J, what people don't tend play. to notice is this little lever here, which is what sets off the minute repeater. Why don't you play those chimes for everybody, Roman? And that is what 700,000 US dollars gets you. Ding, 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 <laughs> ding. Uh, I'm gonna transition right into what you just touched upon. And that and is even subtler. And, and that is Turbions within Patek Philippe. Yep. Patek Philippe, you know my favorite part is, uh, we, you guys know we buy a lot online, right? We have our seller's portal where you guys come in, submit your watches, and we purchase them. How many times, or how many submissions have you had through the seller portal, through Instagram and things like that, of Patek Philippe saying, hey, how much this is worth? And the that is give away that it's a fake watch right off the bat is the fact that there's a, a turbion, turbion cage. A turbion cage. Oh, so. Patek Philippe does not show their turbion, which sometimes pisses off certain people that want to have a Patek Philippe, but at the same token, they are, they want to flex, but yet they can't. So here's a 10-day turbion, which is a significant model from Patek Philippe, and you guys can see the turbion in the back. Yet, the only thing you're going to see in the front is the word turbion, which from far, so what this ends up looking as possibly gondola. a steel watch, a, uh, a, a regular gondola from Patek Philippe. Uh, so again, it's still somewhat of a flex for those that know Patek Philippe and know this case shape, but for the most part, people may think that you have on just some steel dressy watch that's not really a big deal, not $200,000 on a wrist. And I think the bigger flex for Patek Philippe is going to be their turbions, the fact that they hide their turbions. They have made a repeated turbion models like a 5016 where you don't see the turbion, all you see is the words turbion. Even, the their, even, even their most elaborate turbions and highest and hardest sky moon, turbion. sky moon turbion. You still don't they see They call it the sky moon turbine, you do not see the turbion. You do not see the turbion. So let's, let's make our way around the clock here. It's about Rolex. Counterclockwise, why don't we just go to the Tiffany, right? So another subtle flex is something that Rolex used to do back in the day with their Tiffany stamps, and now Patek Philippe does within their boutiques and salons, the Tiffany stamp, right? From far, it's almost unrecognizable. You cannot see it until-, until You have a nipple dial right? GMT. Nipple dial GMT, which, you know, at the most is a 20, let's call it, in the 20s watch. I mean, depending right? on condition, it's, yeah. it's, it, it can be up to $40,000. We're talking about an condition. immaculate condition, immaculate with, condition with every set. single yeah. thing. This is 3X set with just that Tiffany stamp. Exactly, because of the rarity of it, because of the amount of these that were made back at the time that these were made. Anything that's Tiffany stamp is going to increase your value by far on major brands. Right? Absolutely. Now, let's talk about Paddock. Well, now, we don't have a Tiffany stamp Paddock here, but let's just, let's just give a quick, let's just quick analysis. Brand new, 59.80, market price today, rose gold on a bracelet. At the peak of, of the market, any, I would say, let's use Nautilus and Aquanaut as an example. Perfect example. Two to two and a half X, it's retail counter, it's a regular counterpart, I, I should say. I would say the ones that brought the most over um, over their counterpart value were stuff like 5711s, 5167s, where there isn't a lot of, there's a lot of real estate on the dial, I should say, where there's not a lot of complications and you can actually you know, visibly see that Tiffany the less stamp. The less complicated the watch right. was, the more X value it brought over with a Tiffany stamp because the more visible. Uh, I think the least visible Tiffany stamp would be like on a 5712, right? I think it's probably. Uh, 5990 is a tough 5990 one. 5990 is a tough one like too. But like a 5711 white dial Tiffany, it's, it's, it's actually visible. I mean, we don't, we don't have to go far. Yeah. Let's talk about the Tiffany Tiffany pack. Well, that, right? well, you, Six you know, million dollars right. if it's an yeah. auction, right? But I mean, again, with the market slightly coming down on popular models such as Nautilus and Aquanaut, the X value has come down as well. A rule of thumb on any hot model, be it Nautilus or Aquanaut from Patek Philippe, you were sitting at at least two X. Yeah. Right now, you're sitting at about one and a half X, one and a quarter X, yeah. depending on the model, yeah, one right? And a half, yeah. But nevertheless, it's again a flex within a flex, where that tiny little stamp, in a case of vintage Rolexes such as this, it quadruples the value, which is pretty, pretty insane. Uh, speaking of other things that could increase in value quietly, here's a seemingly old president that, you know, condition is a little wobbly, the bracelet is a little wobbly, 
but it's the dials, right? It's the dials, which is more the same when it comes to stamp dials, mm -hmm. but also comes more the same when it comes to special dials. This one happens to be a great example of a Stella dial. But be careful here because condition is everything in terms of value, right? So this is an $80,000 example. You could probably find a green Stella dial at around the $50,000 mark, but the dial would be messed up. To have something with a perfect condition dial, such as on this watch, you pay upwards of $80,000. You pull this dial out, what do you have? A sub $20,000 yep. watch. Again, going in line with what you said, 4X in the very least. And there are plenty of dials out there that are going to be that subtle flex, taking your $20,000 watch and making it an $80,000 watch. And a rule of thumb is going to be your precious stone, oh, not precious, your stone dials, right? A lot of your stone dials will double, triple, sometimes quadruple your value. I've even had an interesting scenario that came up recently with a meteorite, actually a modern meteorite GMT. In other words, because every dial is unique in terms of its, uh, how it looks aesthetically, uh, had a guy that wanted to buy a brand new meteorite GMT. And it was a 2023 with some stickers still on the case. And he was very, very adamant about brand new 2023. Could not talk him in otherwise. He ended up paying more for a 2020 because he liked the dial variation better. And I agreed with him. Something about the 2021, not that 2020 is a different 2023, that specific dial was aesthetically more beautiful. The lines in it, the way it flowed. I think same can be said so, about Mother of Pearl. Mother of Pearl, absolutely. Same can be said about uh, Stone Dolls. Stella yep. Dolls are consistent, right? Because they mix the paint for every doll individually. Uh, the reason they're called Stella Dolls, by the way, is because the company's name was Stella that made the paint mm -hmm. for Rolex to paint each individual doll. So Stella Dolls, you're going to be pretty consistent with uh, Stone Dolls, MOP Dolls. Any, any natural stone, any natural material mm -hmm. out there, be it meteorite, you're going to have variations, and one will look better than the other, depending on your own personal preference. Exactly. I say we go back to dials and talk about unique dials, such as the enamel dial, which we have in the Glossita in Rome, and I think you can talk about this as well. So enamel dials are probably the biggest low-key flex out there when it comes to dials. Because, look, when it comes to Tiffany stamp dials, if you look close enough, you can still see the Tiffany. When it comes to Stella dials, most people recognize a Stella dial for its brightness, be it, be it red, green, or whatever color variations they made it in. When it comes to these dials, it's just a white dial. Yeah. Right. And you really have to look close and hard or really know the model. Like this is the Glashute Glacier, I believe it's called, or the proper pronunciation. Mm -hmm. Right. You have to look close and hard to realize that this is not just a standard white dial, a painted white dial or a steel dial or whatever it might be. This is something that you'd be very, very hard pressed to know. And you, unless you somebody who's specifically into these type of dolls, mm -hmm. if you are into these type of dolls, you're going to be the only person that's going to know. And case in point, it almost doubles, sometimes triples the value of their watches. When it comes to Rolex, there's a Zenith Daytona out there with a white porcelain dial. Uh, it's a 5X the value mm -hmm. of its counterpart. So be on the lookout for these dials across various brands. There's a big following for them. Absolutely. Porcelain dials, when you look closely at them, this is wrapped in plastic. If I were to unwrap the plastic and look at it, as you look at it closely, you realize why people are paying that much more. It's just something about that handmade beauty of porcelain, period, in many applications that attracts people, be it a kitchenware or be it a dial of a watch. It just adds so much oomph to the watch, yet making it a very, very low-key flex. And to go back to the enamel dials, just want to let you know, we just closed the deal on a 3939P, minute repeater, turbulent, subtle flex, enamel dial. That would have been actually the perfect I mean, we can pop that watch in. The, yeah. I, I think, oh, funny you should bring this up, that watch has always been known as uh, the billionaire's undercover watches, at least that's how I dubbed it, maybe not the public. Uh, very, a watch that's very near and dear to my heart, and because of that, that was actually the very first big Patek Philippe I've ever sold, they didn't, going back more than 15 years, it was a 3939. It's a dinky little 36 millimeter watch that is a minute repeater in the Terebi, and that's mm -hmm. not visible. With a portional dial, plain white, from afar, it looks like a $5 watch yet. Uh, at the time, the one I sold was a yellow, gold, black, unique dial. I sold it for $550,000. And guess who it went to? It went to a billionaire. The guy was number 600-something on the Forbes list. Not bad, not bad, not bad. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap this up uh, with something else. And again, we did bring... Uh, well, before we do that, let's talk about something modern that a lot of people there actually... There you go. White gold, yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah, white gold, right? So we have a 116509 white gold blue, blue dial Daytona. A lot of people actually prefer to have the weight and the knowledge themselves that they're wearing something that's a precious metal, not a steel or titanium element, and they'll go with something like a white gold Daytona because that is a true subtle flex. And a lot of people actually know that the watch is gold, but they don't really want to show it. There's also obviously religions that, that won't let you wear 
uh, yellow gold watches. Gold, gold watches. So this is actually a, a perfect example, white gold, blue, blue dial. Daytona. It's funny that I almost skipped over that, and I apologize for that, because I think white gold and platinum, platinum are absolutely. the biggest flexes in watches, period, yep. across pretty much every brand, especially across brands like Rolex, where you know a white gold Daytona seemingly looks like a stainless steel to that, although a Daytona in itself is a flex. But if you look at the reason you we brought this in as an example is to talk about white metals. White metals in general are going to be your low key, low, low key watches, right? Low flex, low key, because most people will think it's a stainless steel watch. Nope, a lot of the people will not realize that's actually a precious well, you're, metal well, watch. Essentially what you're communicating is, hey, I'm willing to, to pay the same price for something that looks a lot che cheaper. Right. And that's and that's a flex. Uh, that's in, a low key flex in its own. Yeah. Where where I'm I'm going to pay some a hundred thousand for something that looks like it could be ten thousand or less. Mm -hmm. And that's where white metals come into play. Another uh, we did bring a uh, IWC mini repeater. And the reason I brought this mini repeater because this is probably least visible mini repeaters because it looks from afar like a plain J IWC Portuguese. And if you don't know what this lever does, especially don't forget your mini repeaters as it sits on your wrist. It sits towards you, right? So most people don't even notice it. Uh, it will most likely, a cuff of something will cover that little lever. So it just looks like a plain J IWC Portuguese, which will trade around 10 grand or even under, in, in, even in gold, right? The white gold version or the platinum version of this is the biggest flex, really. We just don't have one. Since you said cuff, I actually just came up with a scenario in my head. This is weird how my brain works. Matt, you know how when you're at a dinner where you're dressed up, whether it's a wedding, whether it's some type of whatever event, and you click the wine glass to get everybody's attention. Imagine you just went ding, ding, ding. To get people's attention. And if you put it in a cup, it would magnify. <laughs> that would be kind of cool. I don't think it would be allowed. I don't think it would be allowed. That, 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 that would be a flex. That, that would be a flex. That would be a flex. Yeah. <laughs> and last but not least, I want to finish with unknown complication flexes, right? And uh, I brought this Audemars Piguet star wheel. This was made for the 25th anniversary. I love star wheels. So, uh, brief, you know, brief history, and I'm not going to get into details. And going back to the 16th century, there was a pope who had amnesia. Uh, he asked an Italian watchmaker to make him a clock that's going to project time onto the wall. So in the middle of the night when he wakes up, he knows what time it is. He did it by utilizing this disc, and then an oil lamp would project the images onto the wall. This, in turn, inspired Audemars Piguet to create the wondering hours complication, and that's what this is. And a lot of people, just at a glance, because you can't really see it because of the way these discs are positioned, they're like, that looks kind of weird. That maybe that's an Invicta. No. Uh, you, know that, you know that that's the only watch of all watches I've ever dealt with that when I see it, it makes me sing a song? What song? Starboy. By the weekend. Every time I see a Star right. Wheel, I sting Starboy. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Okay. And I really okay. like that song. I think another thing worth mentioning, and also is important, that this is also a watch that inspired Felix Baumgartner to create the brand artwork. Because if you look at the concept behind the little cubes going around the circle, he took it to the next level, obviously making it more 3D. But certainly the watch that inspired him. So that Pope that had amnesia has inspired a lot of things in modern watchmaking. Not to mention the current version of the Star Wheel from AP, which I think is a smoke show. I still haven't seen it in person. I haven't seen it in person either. Not seen it in person I haven't yet. seen it in person either. But the reason we bring this up is there's certain complications out there. That are indeed very complex that drive the price of the watch up. Where at a glance, people say, well, it's just another old millionaire from Audemars Piguet. I should be able to buy one of these for around five grand, 10 nope. grand, right? And meanwhile, these things are trading way over 30, and certain variations of it weigh into 50s and 60. Like the platinum one we just had with the patina? Woo. Yeah, that one sold for Man. 67 or something like Man, that. Man, that was beautiful. I don't remember. So, complications is another low key flex or stealth wealth, as we like to call it. Now, of course, I'm sure there are plenty of examples that we may have missed, but this is the topic of conversation today. This is what we wanted to discuss while showing you guys uh, some example. Comment below watches that you think are definite stealth wealth or quiet luxury. Other than that, Adrian, thank you for joining me, guys. Thank, thank you for, you for having joining me. us. Uh, thank you for watching. Like, comment, share, subscribe, and we'll see you on the next one.